Hi everyone, let's get started with this workshop. So welcome to the second workshop of the 2022 Hackathon by Community. We are joined by John Donahue and he will present his workshop on quantum entanglement and down locality. So I'll let John take it away with this workshop and give a brief introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. I'm excited to chat a little bit about entanglement. So my name is John Donahue. I'm uh, the scientific outreach manager at the Institute for Quantum Computing. Uh, we're a research institute at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we have uh, different research groups in engineering, physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics, uh, computer science, cryptography, all studying different ways in which quantum mechanics can be leveraged for new technologies related to quantum information science. So we have people working on building uh, structures for quantum computers. We have people working on building networks for quantum communication, new kinds of quantum sensors, as well as studying the foundations of quantum mechanics and how that can help us learn more about quantum computing and about quantum science in general. Uh, so myself, I have a PhD from uh, the University of Waterloo where I studied under Professor Kevin Resch. Uh, my background is in experimental quantum optics. So looking at how we can make entangled pairs of photons, how we can measure entangled pairs of photons and how we can manipulate that entanglement and make it have it serve different kinds of purposes. Spent a lot of time in the lab uh, with optics, with laser beams, kind of just building my experiments to make them work. I got really interested in that. Uh, early on when I was in high school, I really thought I wanted to be a theoretical physicist. Uh, I was you know, pretty good at math. I was uh, you know, good at those kinds of things, like thinking about the big ideas. Uh, I got really lucky. I did a co-op program uh, in my first uh, summer of undergrad. Uh, so I was able to work in a theoretical physics lab studying actually theoretical quantum mechanics and quantum control, what kind of laser pulses we need to design to actually control a quantum system optimally. It was really interesting work, but I found that I just could not deal with doing theory all day, every day for four months straight. I needed to get my hands involved somewhere and actually um, build something and have something that I could see with my eyes instead of just plotting on the screen. So theoretical research is for a lot of people. I found that it wasn't for me. I liked being able to take that theory and apply it somewhere. So I did some other co-op work where I was working with lasers, uh, looking at atom traps uh, for use in, the, in particle accelerators out in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, and then was able to find a way to kind of merge those two interests together by looking at experimental quantum information processing in particular with photonics and entanglement. So I uh, had a lot of fun doing that. It's been a really fun field to be in. Of course, in the last 10 years, obviously there's been a ton of excitement and a ton of interest and a ton of progress lately. So, but today I'd like to back up a little bit and talk about what just what entanglement is. Entanglement is one of the most uh, commonly misunderstood features of quantum information. It's one of the things that, you know, when I first heard about it, it, I found it very intriguing, found it very exciting. And it's one of those things that when you start peeling off the layers, realize, hey, maybe this isn't as exciting as I thought it was. Uh, maybe a lot of the things that I first heard about it were just straight up lies. But as you keep peeling and keep peeling, you realize, okay, no, even if it's not going to allow us to do some magic things that someone told me it would do one day, uh, there's still a lot of really cool stuff uh, when we start looking at uh, different quantum particles, different quantum objects, when they're entangled with one another. So what is entanglement? Uh, so entanglement, whenever we're talking about entanglement, we're always talking about multiple quantum systems. So say, for example, that Alice and Bob, we're going to use the code name representations here, where we have Alice in blue and Bob in red. Uh, let's say they have two quantum objects. Could be Alice has an electron, Bob has an electron. Alice has a photon, Bob has a photon, uh, mix and match, whatever you want. They have two quantum objects that we can encode qubits into. Now, normally what we would say is that, our, the kind of our default way of thinking is that those two qubits would be separable. I could think about Alice's qubit independently of thinking about Bob's qubit. I could draw a clear line of separation between Alice and Bob. Entangled states, on the other hand, are those where I cannot describe one without the other. I can't describe Alice's qubit without also describing Bob's qubit. We'll formalize that in a second, but that's kind of the main idea is that when I have an entangled pair of qubits, I can't describe one without also describing the other. 
Now, when people start thinking about it in this way, uh, it starts to sound a little bit romantic, right? We have these kind of images that are all over the internet. This one's actually made by NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So by, you know, real scientists where we think about entanglement as these two deeply romantically connected qubits uh, where one cannot even imagine itself without the other. Uh, it comes up in a lot of movies as well. It comes up in this vampire movie, Only Lovers Left Alive, where two vampires played by Tom Hiddleston and Tilda Swinton are so in love with each other. They've been together for many, many centuries that they become entangled with one another. They kind of feel each other no matter how far apart they are. It comes up in Ant-Man and the Wasp where Ant-Man becomes entangled with the older version of the Wasp and that's how they save each other from the quantum realm. Uh, comes up in Mass Effect 2 as we'll see in a second. And indeed there was a time in 2011 where if you felt deeply in love with someone you could go to a special exhibit in Vegas where they would take entang an entangled photon source blast you and your partner with those entangled photons to make sure that your bond was not only secured in the eyes of the law, but in the eyes of quantum physics as well. So let's take one specific example. Let's look at Mass Effect 2. Let's look at how they use entanglement in the game Mass Effect 2. So there are subtitles there, but let's see what happens. Uh, so at this point in the game, uh, your character Shepard has been sent out into outer space. Uh, Mass Effect relays are what allow this character to travel many, many light years very, very quickly, but we still need to keep in touch with uh, our head base. Uh, and how are we gonna do that? We're gonna use entanglement. What's this area of the ship? This is the FTL communications room. This allows lag-free communication even when you operate off the comm grid. I've never heard of a quantum entanglement communicator. How does it work? Essentially, two subatomic particles are created in an entangled state. One is installed here, and the other in the elusive man's office. When one particle occupies a given quantum state, its entangled partner will always enter the opposite state, no matter the distance between them. If we alter the state of our particle, that alters the state of... This allows us to send data in the form of quantum bits. Okay, so let's break down exactly what their scheme is here. We have Shepard and we have the elusive man who, at this point in the game, we somehow aren't supposed to realize is the bad guy, despite the fact that he literally has glowing eyes. So basically, Shepard and the elusive man, they meet at the elusive man's base and they each uh, exchange some quantum particles. Let's think of sorry, quantum particles. Let's think about them as atoms for now. Shepard, they entangle their quantum particles and Shepard goes away taking his quantum particle with him. Now, when Shepard wants to communicate with the elusive man, they're many, many light years away. If they wanted to send a signal, it would take many, many years. So Shepard is gonna make some alteration to his quantum bit, and that's going to instantaneously change the elusive man's quantum bit. And then when the elusive man measures his quantum bits, they'll be able to uh, determine what message Shepard was sending. Suffice to say, this is absolutely not how entanglement works. The first rule of entanglement club is that you cannot exchange a message faster than the speed of light using entanglement. Uh, this is probably what most of us hear the first time when we start learning about entanglement, that we can use it to like send messages like this. This is absolutely not possible, explicitly ruled out by quantum mechanics. And when everyone hears this, just like, okay, you get a little deflated. It's like, okay, what can you use it for? And in order to figure that out, first we have to kind of dive into some actual details. How does entanglement actually work? So that's what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about two-player quantum systems. We're going to talk about entanglement, mathematically speaking. We're going to get, dive into the Bell CHSH game, a way that we can prove entanglement exists between quantum particles. And then if there's a little time at the end, we'll talk about some applications of entanglement. Now, throughout this, I'm going to assume some knowledge going in. I'm going to assume we're all pretty comfortable with vector operations, that we're all fairly comfortable with bra-ket notation, and the basic ideas of qubits, measuring in different bases, and superposition states. Uh, also note, though, if I start going off the rails at any point, please feel free to type any messages in the chat, and we will have some breaks for questions throughout as well. So get your questions ready. If I'm really losing you, just throw it in the chat and I'll try to slow down and back up a little bit. Okay, so first step will be to talk about two-player quantum mechanics. 
So one of the postulates of quantum mechanics uh, is that separate quantum systems are described by what we call the tensor product of the separate individual Hilbert spaces. Don't worry too much about the details here. A Hilbert space is a space that, in which the vector corresponding to Alice and or Bob's qubit live in. It's a vector space. Uh, the tensor product of those spaces is just a way that we kind of merge those two abstract linear algebra spaces together. And what we're basically doing there is finding a way to describe both qubits at the same time. So Alice has a qubit. Let's say she has the qubit zero, just to make it concrete for now. And Bob has a qubit, an electron in the state one. Both of those are described by a two-dimensional vector, Alice's two-dimensional vector and Bob's two-dimensional vector. Now we want to find a way to express them both at the same time. And that's what the tensor product does. The tensor product we often write down as this little circle with an X in it. So zero, we would call this zero tensor one or the tensor product of Alice and Bob's qubits. Uh, so Alice has zero, Bob has one. We're gonna write that down as the two qubit state zero one, where that means that Alice has zero, Bob has one. In vector form, we would say that Alice has the state zero, that's the one zero vector. Bob has a state one, that's the zero one vector. Now, when we tensor product two two dimensional vectors together, we get a four dimensional vector. We kind of increase the number, uh, increase the dimensionality of that vector. Now, why that happens should make some sense. What we've basically done is gone from uh, a, a qubit situation. A qubit has one of two possible states, zero or one, or any superposition thereof, to uh, a set of states, a basis that has four possible states, four mutually exclusive states. So we could have the state where Alice and Bob both have zero, where Alice has zero and Bob has one, where Alice has one and Bob has zero, or where Alice and Bob both have one. These are all four mutually exclusive states. These are four possible basis states that could exist. So our new computational basis is no longer a two-dimensional basis, but rather a joint four-dimensional basis. Okay, so Alice and Bob's two qubit system, instead of being represented as Alice and Bob's system, can be represented together as Alice and Bob's four dimensional system. Now we're gonna, I showed some vectors there, but for the most part, we're gonna use bracket notation to really simplify our composite systems. If you have a piece of paper, feel free to try to get ahead of me on some of these. So our first task would be to find this state in the computational basis. So Alice has the plus, Superposition, Alice is in the state plus, and Bob, Bob's qubit, Bob's qubit is in the state minus. How do we really express this in the computational basis? Give you just a second to get ahead of me. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to express Alice and Bob's state individually in the, yeah, that's one way to do it. Absolutely, we could just write it as plus minus, but we want to express it in the computational basis. So we want to, uh, by computational basis, I mean we want to express it in terms of the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 states. So we're going to express Alice and Bob states individually first. The plus state is 0, plus 1. The minus state is 0, minus 1, with the tensor product in the middle. And then to express that out further, we're just going to expand. Think about it the same way we would expand uh, x plus y times z plus w in brackets. We're going to take 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and just pay attention to what sign each picks up. So we have 0, 0 with a plus sign, 0, 1 with a minus sign, 1, 0 with a plus sign, and 1, 1 with a minus sign. Yeah, and that would be Alice and Bob's joint state in the uh, in the computational basis. Exactly, it's just going to be using the FOIL method. So uh, don't get me wrong, we have to be a little careful. It's not like, uh, remember when we're dealing with quantum states, they don't commute like X times Y is not necessarily the same as Y times X and that kind of thing, but it's a very similar kind of intuition. Now, of course, ultimately, what are we doing with these quantum states? They are ways, uh, as an experimentalist, they are ways for us to calculate the probability of making certain measurements. So we can make measurements on Alice and Bob systems individually with outcome probabilities defined by a two qubit version of Born's rule. So let's look at this state instead here. Alice has the qubit in the state zero. Bob has a qubit in the state plus. So if we expand that out in the same way, the two qubit state is zero, zero plus zero, one, right? There's some probability of finding both qubits to be zero, some probability of finding Alice to be zero and Bob to be one, but it's, we're never going to find Alice's qubit to be in the state one. 
So it's the probability that we measure zero, zero, while we look at the inner product of the zero, zero state with our state, uh, take the absolute value squared, we find that that's 50%, one half. The probability of measuring zero, one, similarly is also one half. And if we do the same thing for one, zero and one, one, we find there's no component of that state in our state here. So that value is equal to zero. There's a 0% chance of finding uh, our two qubit state in the state one, zero or one, one. Okay. So if we want to find probabilities, we do it in a very similar way to the one qubit case. Now, what about if these qubits are entangled? Everything so far we've been talking about saying we have Alice's qubit and we have Bob's qubit, and now we're gonna look at them together. What happens if I just give you a two qubit state and ask you, can we think about it as Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit? So entanglement is actually defined in reverse. If a state is not separable, so a separable state is one that I can think about that I can mathematically write down as Alice has a qubit and Bob has a qubit and we tensor product them together. If I can't write down the state like that, then we call that state entangled. So it's really defined uh, negatively. So let's look at an example. Is this state entangled? So take a look at it, use your gut and just throw that in the chat. Do you think this state here is entangled? The state zero one minus one one. Okay, seeing some yeses, seeing a couple no's as well. Okay, a little bit of a mixed reaction. Let's think about it. So we have uh, a state that has two components in the computational basis. Alice has zero, Bob has one. Alice has one, Bob has one. So is the state entangled? Can I think about this as Alice qubits and Alice has a qubit and Bob has a qubit? Well, what I can do is I can notice that no matter what, Bob is in the state one. It doesn't matter what Alice's qubit is. Bob's qubit is always in the state one. So in the same way that something like x, y, sorry for the terrible drawing here, plus z, y, I can factor out the y there. I can kind of factor out Bob's qubit from this as well. I'm being a little sloppy with the math there, but that's effectively what we're doing is we're factoring out Bob's qubit. So no, this state is not entangled. I can write it down as Alice has a state minus and Bob has the state one. Uh, so this state is separable. It can be separated into Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit. Okay, so that state's not entangled. What about this state here? Is this state entangled? I guess, first off, can I pull the same trick with this state where the state is Alice has zero, Bob has one, Alice has one, Bob has zero. Can I factor anything out of this? No, I can't factor anything out because they're different in both cases. This is, uh, yeah, this is something else entirely here. Uh, that's not enough to say it's entangled yet, but I will promise you that yes, the state is entangled. I'm not gonna go through it step by step, but you can show it by contradiction. Uh, write down a general two qubit state that is separable. So. Alice has the state zero plus one with some random co with some uh, arbitrary coefficients a and b. Bob has a state zero plus one with arbitrary coefficients c and d. And you can show that there is no values for a, b, c, and d that give you this state. Yeah, they don't necessarily have to be opposites to be entangled. The state zero zero minus one one, so where they're always equal, that's also entangled. The important thing is that I can't express it like this. Remember that zero and one are also just random labels. They don't actually mean anything necessarily. It all depends on what the actual qubit is. Not random labels, they mean something, but they, they don't mean necessarily much physically. Okay, so what are the two qubit measurement probabilities for this entangled state? Let's focus on this entangled state. This is actually a special entangled state that we call the singlet state. Uh, or the psi minus state sometimes. So we look at it, it's Alice has zero, Bob has one, or Alice has one, Bob has zero. So what's the probability that they both have zero? There's no component there, so the probability there is zero. What's the probability that Alice has zero and Bob has one? There's a one over root two component there, so that's a 50% probability. The probability that Bob, uh, sorry, Alice has one and Bob has zero, once again, a one over root two component, so a 50% probability. 
And the probability they both have one, zero component there, zero probability. So we still see that there are two possibilities that have a 50% chance, but note that if you ask in advance, is Alice's qubit zero or a one? There's a 50% chance her qubit is zero. There's a 50% chance her qubit is one. Is Bob's qubit zero or one? There's a 50% chance it's zero. There's a 50% chance it's one. It looks like complete noise. It looks completely random to Alice and Bob individually. But if you look at their qubits together, you see these correlations. Whenever Alice measures zero, Bob also measures, Bob, sorry, whenever Alice measures zero, Bob measures one. Whenever Bob measures zero, Alice measures one. They always measure the opposite results in this case. This is not, this is not the only, uh, there are other entangled states where they always measure the same. There's nothing unique about that, but for this particular case, they always measure anti-correlations. So their measurement results are individually random, but correlated when you look at them together. Okay, so first thing you might think is, uh, yeah, the percent is always 100% about it. So this is 50%, 50% here. So that, 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 that should be okay. So you might think, okay, if they're correlated, that must mean they're entangled. And that's not necessarily the whole story either. So let's look at a case of correlation that has obviously nothing to do with quantum mechanics. So we once again have Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob have a pair of shoes. Now, without looking, Alice and Bob take a pair of boxes and put a shoe into each box, okay? So one box has one shoe, the other box has the other shoe. We know it was originally uh, a complete pair of shoes. So one is the left shoe, one is the right shoe. Now, Alice is going to hop on a spaceship, leave Earth and go to Saturn. Why not Saturn? Saturn seems nice this time of year. And then when she arrives on Saturn, she's going to open her box and find that she has the right shoe. Now, without looking, without telephoning Bob, she knows immediately that Bob has the other shoe, the left shoe. So their results are anti-correlated. If Alice measures right shoe, Bob has left shoe. If Alice measures left shoe, Bob has right shoe. The results are absolutely correlated, and uh, they could have done the same thing if they used a pair of entangled photons. You know, Alice's would have been spin up, Bob's would have been spin down. Alice, Bob's would have been, if Bob's was spin up, Alice's would have been spin down. It's all would have given the same correlations. So these correlations are interesting. They share some kind of underlying information, but there's nothing spooky there at all. Really, correlation is incredibly classical. It's very easy to come up with situations where uh, information that Alice measures is correlated with information that Bob measures. What makes entanglement different is that entanglement is this idea of correlation in addition to the idea of superposition. So let's do the same experiment, but use quantum notation this time. Okay, and the question I'm gonna ask you here is what separates uh, either having the state zero, one or one zero? So say that that's our shoe example, we either randomly prepare the state what, zero, one, or we randomly prepare the state one zero, what separates that from having this truly entangled state zero one minus one zero? Okay, so we're gonna dive into this. Let's, I want you to think about it for a second before we dive in. What separates these two situations? They're both correlated, but what makes them different? If you have any thoughts and they don't, have, they don't have to have completely worked out yet, but if you have any ideas, feel free to post in the chat. The or, yeah, okay, I got one message saying the or makes a difference. The or definitely is gonna make a difference there. And I guess the question there is then what separates an or from a minus sign? What makes those two different? But let's dive in, let's dive in a little bit relationship between them in the second one. There's a relationship between them in both, but the nature of the relationship is very different. Okay, so let's look at the correlated case first. I'm gonna use some color coding, Alice in blue, Bob in red. So in the correlated case, they either have the state zero one or the state one zero. This is kind of like someone else knows which state they actually have, but they don't necessarily know. Okay, what happens as we know, in quantum mechanics, we aren't limited to just measure in the zero one basis. We can also make measurements in the plus minus basis, for example. We can measure in the superposition basis. And recall, if I want to express 
uh, the zero and one states in the superposition basis, I can do that in this way. Zero, just as uh, plus is equal to zero plus one over root two, zero is equal to plus plus minus over root two, and one is equal to plus minus minus over root two. The basic idea here being, if I measure in the plus minus basis and I have the state zero, the outcome is a 50-50 superposition. It's completely random. So let's look at this case. I have the state zero, one, and now I look at what that looks like in a plus minus basis. Zero is plus plus minus. Uh, one is plus minus minus. When I say it out loud, it's just going to sound like I'm saying a bunch of pluses and minuses in a row. So don't pay attention to my words so much as what's on the screen in this board or else it gets back fairly confusing. Uh, the important part is, yeah, they both have these superpositions of plus and minus. And now if I expand that out in the same way that we did before using kind of that FOIL method, plus plus, minus plus minus, plus minus plus, minus minus minus, we end up with these four terms here. So now if they make a measurement in the plus minus basis, there is a, I'm not worried about normalization anymore just to make our life easy. So there is a 25% chance to measure plus plus, a 25% chance to measure plus minus, 25% chance it's minus plus, 25% chance it's minus minus. So their outcome is completely random in the plus minus basis. Literally anything could be measured with an equal probability. They do the same thing over here. It changes where the minus sign goes, but ultimately it's the same thing. We get a superposition of all four possibilities, each with a 25% chance of being measured. So if they get this state completely random in the plus minus basis, if they get the other state, it's also completely random in the plus minus basis. Okay, so that's the or case. If they measure in plus minus basis, it's completely random. But what about if the qubits are actually entangled? So what if there's actually a plus sign here? Okay, I think I should, I, this should be a minus sign there, but the idea works out the exact same if there's a minus sign or a plus sign. So now they, what we have to do, instead of thinking about these two cases individually, we have to think about them together. Okay, so we're gonna add this plus sign here in between all of them. And now we have this case in superposition with this case. And what we find, is that the plus plus and the plus plus, they add together coherently. The plus minus case and the plus minus case here, there's a minus sign in this one and a plus sign in this one. So they destructively interfere and cancel each other out. The minus plus and the minus plus, there's a plus sign here, a minus sign here. They destructively interfere and cancel each other out. The minus minus and the minus minus, they both have a minus sign. They constructively interfere and we still see that possibility. So those cancel out and we're left with the state plus plus minus minus minus. So when they were unentangled, it was completely random when we changed the basis. When the state is truly entangled, we do see this kind of non-local interference and those correlations remain. It doesn't matter if I measure in the zero one basis or the plus minus basis, there's still that correlation. If I met, if Alice measures Hugh cubed in the plus minus basis, she knows what state Bob will measure if he also measures in the plus minus basis. Alice measures plus, Bob measures plus. Alice measures minus, Bob measures minus. The correlations remain independent of the basis in which we measure in. Okay. And that's the difference between correlation and entanglement is that these correlations can remain in different bases. So I'm gonna move on to Bell's inequalities right after this. Uh, but before I do, are there any questions that anyone has? Feel free to either raise hand or just type in the chat, either one's okay. How does it change with three qubits? Yeah. Um, so conceptually, it's it's all the same. Just instead of them sharing correlations between Alice and Bob, there might be sharing correlations between Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So maybe um, because I'm terrible at writing with my mouse, I'm not going to bother with bras and cats, but we could have a state like zero, zero, zero plus one, one, one. If Alice measures her qubit to be zero, she knows Bob and Charlie also measure zero. Um, Entanglement does get more complicated the more qubits you have. Uh, 
when you start fine graining it, there's different classes of entanglement that exists with more particles that don't exist with fewer particles. Like for example, this is what we call a GHZ state, but there's other states called the W states that look like this. Uh. Uh, these are called the W states. Uh, and it that might look like, you know, okay, they don't seem that different from each other, but it turns out there's actually no way to convert one from the other uh, with perfect probability. So these are two inequivalent classes of entanglement. So conceptually though, it's the exact same. It's all still about correlations. Uh, and instead of dealing with a four dimensional space, you have an eight dimensional space and, you know, a 16 dimensional space before and so on and so forth. Does the number of probabilities entanglement have based on the number of combinations of zeros and ones can have for the number of qubits? Uh, it's all dependent on those weights. So I could have an entangled state that, so the ones we've been looking at were 50-50, uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, for example. But I could have a state that's like 0, 0, plus like epsilon 1, 1. So like this is like uh, mostly zero, zero, but a little probability of having one, one. Um, you can get more complicated that way for sure. But uh, yeah, and so the probabilities don't always have to be 50-50. Um, the number of possible outcomes is limited by the number of qubits. So there's only four possible uh, distinguishable states for two qubits, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. As you have more qubits, you get more distinguishable states. And so, yeah, for, yeah. More distinguishable combinations is maybe a better word there. All right. So if you have any other questions, though, feel free to post them in the chat. But let's get started on Bell's inequality a bit. So with Bell's inequalities, we're looking at something a little different, looking at something called an observable. So Alice and Bob, let's say they share this entangled state, uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. That's also equal to plus, minus, 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 plus. So two qubit binary observables, what they do is they ask questions about their correlations. So for example, the two qubit observable ZZ, uh, what that does is it asks, are Alice and Bob correlated if they both measure in the Z basis, in the zero one basis? So we that have this represented in the zero one basis here, and we find that they are anti-correlated. If one measures zero, the others measures one and vice versa. This has what we call a negative correlation. So the, what we call the, um, the value of the observable ZZ is equal to negative one for this state. It means that they always measure the opposite. If it's positive one, they always measure the same. Negative one, they always measure the opposite. Zero, their results have nothing to do with one another. Similarly, we see that they have these same negative correlations in the plus minus basis, in that superposition basis. So the value of the observable XX is also equal to minus one. However, they are not always correlated with each other. It does, it does matter which kind of measurement they make. Say that Alice measures in the superposition basis and Bob measures in the Z basis, in the zero one basis, then they share no correlation with each other whatsoever. The value of the observable is zero. Similarly, if Alice measures in the plus, sorry, if Alice measures in the zero one basis and Bob measures in the plus minus basis, the value of the observable is also zero. Okay, so it matters which kind of measurement you make. Now, this seems pretty cool so far. If we, we measure correlations in both the zero, one, and the plus, minus basis. And if we do that, the state is entangled. Huzzah! But what if this is all just a trick? What if there's another way to explain our results with some kind of conspiracy? Maybe there's a hidden variable underneath all of this uh, that is actually controlling things behind the scenes. So we need something stronger than this to actually prove to someone, to prove to a skeptic that we actually have entanglement. And that's where the CHSH game and Bell's inequality comes in. Okay. So the spookier aspects of entanglement, including uh, of quantum mechanics, including entanglement, they took a while to accept among physicists. Uh, maybe one of the ideas was instead of needing these non-local superpositions, we saw that like kind of non-local interference. We had interference happen between two qubits that could have in principle been many, 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 many uh, a long distance away from each other. Maybe a more complete theory was hiding just out of sight. 
For example, maybe the photons carry an extra hidden variable that tells us Bell tells them how to behave depending on how they're measured. This is the idea of John Stuart Bell. Well, John Stuart Bell's idea was actually what disproved this. So we know that they share correlations if they're measured in the zero one basis. We know they share correlations if they're measured in the plus minus basis. A hidden variable can explain this result. Say that each photon actually carries two bits of information. Uh, one bit of information is uh, what tells the photon how to behave if it's measured in the zero one basis. So, you know, Alice and Bob's photons are created and then there's a shared bit of information that says, okay, uh, if measured in the zero one basis, I'm gonna be zero, you're gonna be one this time. And they also carry another bit of information if they're measured in the plus minus basis. What tells them, okay, if we're measuring the plus minus basis, I'm gonna be plus, you're gonna be minus. We know this in advance, we plan this out in advance. So they have to carry more information for this to work. But if we're not able to see this happening under the scene, how do we know this doesn't exist? Maybe this does exist. Maybe photons are carrying these little conspiracy theory bits of information that are just there to mess with us. And maybe that's easier to believe than entanglement for some people, who knows? Can we build an experiment that actually tells, actually behaves in such a way that rules out this kind of theory? And that's the idea of the CHSH gang. So this is uh, not the first experiment, not the first proposal to rule this out, but probably the simplest. So let's say that we have Alice and Bob. We're gonna talk about this like it's a game. Alice and Bob, there's a wall between them. They can't talk to each other. They could have had any strategy they wanted before this wall was built. They could have shared any amount of information before the wall was built. But once the wall was built, they are unable to talk to each other anymore. Just to make it easy, let's send Alice over to Uranus. Let's send Bob over to Mars so that they're incredibly far apart from each other as well. And now on each of these separate planets, they each are being questioned by an agent. And the agent is gonna ask them one of two questions, one of two very important questions. And those questions are question zero or question one, one of two different questions. And Alice and Bob are allowed to respond in one of two ways. They can either say plus one or minus one. Okay, so what they want to do is try to make their table look something like this. If they are both asked question zero, their answers should agree with each other. They should both say plus one or they should both say minus one. Another way to say that is that the results should multiply together two plus one. If Alice is asked zero and Bob is asked one, they should also agree with each other. Their results should multiply to plus one. If they're both asked, sorry, if Alice is asked one and Bob is asked zero, they should also agree with each other. And if they're both asked question one, then they, were, they should actually disagree with each other. One should say plus one, the other should say minus one or vice versa, such that the results multiply together to minus one. Now the question is, what's the probability that Alice and Bob win this game? So we can turn this into a maximization problem by looking at maximizing this parameter S, which is equal to, um, kind of, uh, which is equal to Alice's result uh, if she's asked zero times Bob's result if he's asked zero, plus Alice's result if, he, if she's asked zero times Bob's result if, he asked, if he's asked one, plus Alice's result if she's asked one times Bob's result if he's asked zero. And then because we want them to disagree for the last one, minus their results if they're both asked the question one. Now, for any non-random strategy, any deterministic strategy where they really plan out in advance exactly what they're going to do, the value of S is either plus two or minus two. Remember that they're only allowed to answer plus one or minus one in this situation. So just factoring like terms a bit, we see that we get a situation we can factor it into a B, B naught plus B one, a B naught minus B one. Uh, B naught and B1 have to be either plus one or minus one. So either they're both plus one, in which case this term is two, this term is zero. They're both minus one, in which case this term is minus two, this term is zero, or they're opposite of each other, in which case this term is plus or minus one and this term is zero. So one of the terms is going to be zero no matter what. A1 or A2, A sorry, A naught and A1, those are equal to plus or minus one as well. So the overall result is gonna be plus or minus two times plus or minus one, which is either plus or minus two. So the value is either plus two or minus two. Now, okay, that's if we have a deterministic strategy beforehand. Let's say we're able to 
do some randomness. We're able to actually change our strategy a little bit uh, and make sure it's random so the agents aren't able to predict in advance what we're going to do. Even then, the answer has to be between plus two and minus two. So the absolute value of such a strategy, the absolute value of the average uh, has to be less than or equal to two. Think about it like a weighted average. Let's say we have little Timmy uh, and little Timmy has three parts that are going to make up his grade for his, uh, for his math class. He's got a 60% on his homeworks, a 70% on his quizzes and an 80% on his tests. Now, I'm not telling you in advance what percent each is worth. I'm not telling you, you know, maybe the homework's worth 100%, maybe the test is worth 100%, maybe they're each worth 33%, who knows? But even without that information, we can say that Timmy's grade is not going to be less than 60%, and it's not going to be more than 80%, because we know it's gotta be somewhere between those values, even if we kind of randomly change their proportion. Okay, this is what we call the classical limit for the CHSH game. Now, let's do something a little bit different. Let's say that instead of just sharing classical correlations, they actually share quantum correlations. So they share this entangled state, psi minus. Now, depending on the question they're asked, they're going to make one of the following measurements. If Alice is asked question zero, she's going to make a Z measurement. She's going to ask the question, are you zero or one? And if she's asked question one, she's going to make an X measurement instead. She's going to ask it if it's plus or minus. Bob's going to have a slightly more complicated set of measurements. They correspond to these operators here. They're kind of somewhere between the Z and X measurements with different angles there. Um, so if you're comfortable with the block sphere, Alice is asking measurements along this axis or this axis, and Bob is asking measurements along this axis and this axis. What is the expected joint measurement result? We are running a little bit behind, so I'm going to kind of skip through some of the math. Um, but effectively, uh, for the first case, we look at the expectation value of this operator here, and we find that it is equal to 1 over root 2. We do that for all of those different operators, and we get that the expectation value for A0, B0 is 1 over root 2, A0, B1 is 1 over root 2, A1, B0 is 1 over root 2, A1, B2 sorry, A1, B1 is negative one over root two. So there's a negative sign that happens to sneak in there. And now when we add those all up, one over root two plus one over root two plus one over root two minus minus one over root two, that's equal to four over root two, two times the square root of two, which is about 2.83, which is greater than the classical limit of two. So using these entangled states, we are able to actually do something that, want, that classical correlations are completely unable to accomplish. Thinking about it back in terms of a game with regular correlations, we have about a 75% chance of winning this game at absolute most. And with quantum correlations, we have an 85.4% chance of winning the game. So we're able to boost our probability of winning using these quantum correlations. Okay, uh, I did have a question break in here, but I want to leave some time for general questions at the end. So I'm just gonna kind of flip through a couple of concluding slides. So, our local hidden variable model that we initially established, uh, that idea of you know, them carrying these extra bits of information, relied on two assumptions. Locality, it relied on the fact that what happens in one location cannot have an effect on what happens elsewhere unless it sends a signal. If there was some case where Alice and Bob could cheat and tell each other which question they're being asked, they could signal to each other, they could win the game, of course. So we're assuming that the quantum particles are not signaling back and forth to each other. A little more subtly, we also assumed realism. We assumed that kind of the, the way they talk about this is that the properties of objects are described by an element of reality, independent of whether or not they are observed. So we talked about them in terms of A0, B0, B1, A1, and we assumed that those, those measurement outcomes corresponded to something physical in the world. Effectively, what we assumed is that we could take all those measurement outcomes individually and think about them as if they operated together. Now, we know that we can break those assumptions using entangled states. So therefore, what Bell's inequality tells us is that quantum mechanics is one of two things. It is either non-local, either it means that there is something that is signaling and allowing uh, these quantum states to beat Bell's inequality, or it is non-realistic. We cannot ascribe an element of reality to a measurement before we actually make that measurement. One of those two has to fail. Uh, 
most physicists end up kind of going towards the non-realistic model when we start really thinking about it, but uh, there are a few who assume that there's some non-local effects happening. Okay, so entanglement does seem to stretch the idea of locality where an action taken here cannot affect something happening over there uh, without a signal traveling between them. But the important thing there is that the first rule of entanglement club, entanglement does not allow information to travel faster than the speed of light. So let's re-examine what happens in the Bell inequality. Alice makes a measurement. She immediately knows Bob's state. But remember that her measurement itself was completely random. She didn't know in advance whether she was gonna get zero or one or if she measured the superposition basis plus or minus. So she can influence which state Bob has if she chooses which basis to measure in, she knows which state Bob, she knows which basis Bob's state will be in. But she can only tell him which basis to measure in with that classical communication. So she still needs to send a classical signal to Bob. There's no way for her to get that information over to Bob without sending an additional signal. So there's a subtle distinction here where if I want to beat the CHSH game classically, I need to use faster than light communication. Uh, if I want to simulate the effect of entanglement, I need faster than light communication, but I cannot use entanglement itself to signal information faster than the speed of light. Now, there's a bunch of different ways we can create entanglements. We can think about having two objects that actually talk to each other, say two electrons that feel each other's magnetic field, causing their spins to become aligned with each other. We can think about particles that are created at the same time. Think about a photon that annihilates into a particle and its antiparticle. Maybe they have some properties like polarization or momentum that are bound by a conservation law, causing them to be related to each other. Lots of different ways that we can actually create entanglement between these systems or engineer it when we talk about using it for quantum computation. I'm going to skip through this because we are running a little bit low on time. Um, but one of the important things about entanglement is that the complexity of it is one of the reasons why uh, one of the, is uh, widely thought to be one of the reasons why quantum computing is so effective in the first place. So classical bits we can think about as being zero, one, or anywhere in between. Quantum bits we can think about as being zero, one, or anywhere on the surface or in the interior of the block sphere. So in order to describe these classical bits, I need two to the n numbers. I need to know if it's zero, I need to know the probability of each being zero or one. For the qubits, I need to know not just whether they're zero or one, but also if they're plus or minus, also if they're plus i or minus i, everything like that. So it's actually two to the power n times two to the power n numbers to describe that. That's an exponential separation, a two to the power n separation between the two. As the system grows, the quantum system is exponentially more complex, but that only holds if they're entangled. If they aren't entangled, I can think about each of these qubits individually. Uh, and I no longer get that exponential separation between the two. So it's really only holds if those two qubits are indeed entangled with one another. Entanglement also comes up in quantum error correction. The basic idea there being I'm going to actually encode my zero and one across many qubits using a massively entangled state. This actually allows us to be resilient to errors. Lots of applications for entanglement in sensors as well. Things like the squeeze states used at the uh, gravitational wave observatory LIGO, noon states uh, for things like qu enhanced quantum lithography, quantum enhanced noise radar, lots of ways that we use entanglement in sensing and lots of ideas for making even stronger sensors using entanglement. Um, and yeah, if there are two main takeaways, entanglement is a coherent superposition that exists between multiple comp quantum systems. It is correlation, but it's a coherent effect that exists between separate quantum systems. And it implies that the universe does not obey local realism. We have to throw out either realism or locality uh, is one of the lessons that entanglement and the Bell's inequalities teach us about the universe. With that, I would like to thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you so much to community for hosting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you have any questions, you can reach me by email. You can follow uh, IQC on social media, visit us on our website. And I am more than happy to hang around for the next couple of minutes and answer any last questions. Oh, thanks, Travis. All right.
I don't see any other questions at the moment. Maybe if we stop the recording, just in case someone doesn't want their question recorded. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, first of all, let's all thank John for giving this amazing talk today. I definitely hope that everyone learned a lot from this talk and thank you for everyone for coming as well. Um, one more thing before we end this meeting, if you haven't heard already, we're also hosting a giveaway for some prizes. So all you have to do is post a picture of you and your team hacking in order to join this giveaway. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming and good luck hacking. Good luck, everyone.